Good morning. You may be seated. God is good. And all the time, Satan is bad. All the time. And all the time, I tell that to students all the time. They liked it a little bit more than you did, but that's okay. Well, according to the Christian and liturgical calendar, it's Pentecost Sunday. Now, I know I've gone where no wise guest speaker should probably go in their first 10 seconds. I've mentioned two words that can be a lightning rod in church circles. I've mentioned the word liturgy, and I've mentioned the word Pentecost. Now, a few of you, in hearing that it's Pentecost Sunday, maybe it's your first time, you got a little nervous. It's understandable, right? Pentecostals are awesome when you're in crisis and you need prayer. When I have a prayer need, I want to go to my Pentecostal friends. Pentecostals, we're a little less reliable when it comes to short church services, not having any surprises on a Sunday morning, and finishing in time to beat the Methodists to the church buffet. Now, a few of you, you you got excited. You've been counting down for Pentecost. You've got one of those apps in your phone, like my mom has, that I'm going to come visit and bring her grandson. You've been counting down the days to Pentecost Sunday. Well, for those that got nervous that it's Pentecost Sunday and there's a guest speaker, don't worry, I'm not preaching out of Acts today. I'm preaching out of Romans. People that are serious about the gospel love Romans, so don't worry. But for those that got excited, stick with me, because I am preaching out of Romans 8, a passage that talks about how do we live a life led by the Holy Spirit. And some of you just thought, well okay, this light-skinned Christian brother is actually going to be worth listening to. I got you covered this morning. I've got you covered. Before we get to our text, I'm so glad to have my wife Hannah with me today, and my son is in Sunday school. Hopefully he's behaving. If not, blame me and not her, please. That would make my marriage a lot easier. But I am thankful to be here today. I've gotten to know your pastor Pastor Albert, Dr. ABK, over the past several years. And I, I got to be honest, there's nothing for me more special than getting to preach at the church of a friend. I love being able to preach at churches like yours that love missionaries, that support gospel endeavors, that can worship with the best of them. And that's your church as well. But it's a special privilege to be able to speak and to stand here for a friend. And Dr. ABK is a good friend. Can I get an amen? Amen. He always asks me about my family. He never has a meeting or makes a call that's impersonal. And I'm sure that's not just my experience either. And yes, even when we were just speaking on the phone recently to talk about logistics or to discuss the launch of his book, which I loved his book, by the way, I'll be referencing it. No, he does not pay me to do that. How do you think the calls, the phone calls that I have with Dr. ABK, how do you think they end? Does anybody know? And how do you think that they begin? And what do you think we did in the middle of the call? Like, I thought I was just calling to see what time to show up at the middle school. But I accidentally dialed in, I guess, to the church prayer line. I don't know. I accidentally, I guess, volunteered to be an intercessor. I had no idea. This isn't even my church. For context, in Chi Alpha Campus Ministries, I usually instruct my students, our new staff, especially when we're in public, I give them two pieces of advice and prayer, so it's definitely not as profound as the book Audacious Prayers. Here's my two pieces of advice. I say, make it meaningful and make it brief. Now, can I be honest? Is that okay? When I pray with your pastor, 100% of the time, it's always meaningful. Can I get an amen? amen? To him, I think he thinks it's brief. It's under 10 minutes. For me, it feels like I got teleported to the throne room of Jesus. It feels like I'm living in Revelation 9. I think in the book, there's, there's so many great stories. I, I, there's times when I laughed, I cried, I was frustrated because I was convicted. And I, I think in the book, he talks about praying, and maybe I'm just making this up or the Holy Spirit is giving me a word, I don't know. But I think he mentioned even praying, like, like for the like when he's ordering a pizza 
Like praying. And I'm wondering now, like, does he pray for the person taking the order and the delivery person? Like, I think he might pray for my son more than I do. I thought I had a prayer life, but I, I, I don't think I did. I'm trying to get one now. That's why I got a copy of the book. He's a great friend, great prayer warrior, and a model of intercession. And I'm challenged and encouraged, and I'm stirred up as the book encourages us. I, I've, I've regained my fighting spirit in prayer because of reading this, and I'm taking my staff through this as well, and I'm so grateful for it. And I hope you know how blessed you are by his leadership and by his writing. Well, recently I was in a rabbit hole on the internet. And I'm not sure I'm the only one in the room that's ever been there. Some of you have been there this week. You just found yourself, you thought you were going to get online for something, and 30 minutes later you were looking at something else. Some of you are there right now. You're pretending to be on YouVersion or on the church app. You're on Instagram. I see your thumb scrolling up. The Lord forgives you, and I'm working on forgiving you as well. Well, I don't know exactly how I wound up where I wound up on the internet, but I found myself this week in a message forum with bird owners. It's important to note two things. One, I don't frequent message forums, and I don't own a bird. I have bird tattoos, and that's another story for another time. I got sucked into this rabbit hole in the internet, and I was reading a question that a bird owner was posing. They were trying to get advice from other bird owners. Remember, I'm not one of them, but I've just peered into this conversation. So this was the gist of the question. If we keep a parrot in a cage for almost 12 years, will the parrot still be able to fly? Well, now I was intrigued. I put my lunch down. I told the staff, please don't interrupt me. I didn't lie and say I was praying, but I was like, I'm doing something important. And here's what one of the best responses said. Your parrot will not want to fly because they may have never learned. And by now they probably have no confidence in their ability to fly. Someone else chimed in. This was a very like vibrant bird community I'd stumbled upon. Someone said, if your bird was bred in captivity and wasn't ever given time to roam freely with other birds, it might not know how to fly because it's never been taught, and even more unbelievable, it may never have seen another bird like it ever fly. So it might not know that it could fly. To sum it all up, to give you a window into my lunch a few days ago on campus, in this forum, from this stranger, as a non-bird owner, the bird is not going to fly. There's so many possible reasons, and if we had an avian vet here, they'd probably mention muscle atrophy at the top of the list. The non-use of the wings can lead to the inability to use them. But to sum up what I read in this forum, it'd be as follows, that the bird may not know how. The bird may know how, but not have the confidence to try. And thirdly, the bird may have never seen flight, which means it didn't even know it was rejecting a possible option. Well, I'm convinced after reading this and thinking about it, that this type of reality, this might be a pattern in your life and in my life and in the life of believers sitting in great churches just like this all throughout the DMV. See, I can personally relate to this metaphor of the bird, unable to truly explore freedom because of past experience unable to be who they were designed and destined to be because of what had happened to them, what had happened around them. So today the message is titled, A Reminder to Walk in Freedom. And maybe it'd be better if I had titled it, A Reminder to Fly in Freedom. See, some of us here, if we're being honest with ourselves, we aren't experiencing a life of freedom. We're like the bird, the parrot in the cage. We have not flown recently, and we're unsure if we could fly today. Even if our most difficult circumstances change and our biggest prayers were answered, we're not yet sure if the freedom would reach our interior life. When people ask how we're doing at church, at the grocery store, in our neighborhoods, or at work, we alternate between the following quick responses. I'm fine. I'm busy. I'm blessed. If you're having a good day, you might say that. 
or I'm stressed. We'd never answer, well, I'm walking in freedom today. Or I'm feeling free. And it's not because it's a little bit cheesy. It's because it's not our true reality. And I get that. I understand that. This is one of those messages that I feel like is just as much for me as it might be for somebody here, whether you're in the middle school or watching on the live stream. As someone personally that's had serious struggles with mental health concerns like anxiety and depression, there were months while I was following Jesus, that I felt every single emotion except for freedom. As someone who's personally had multiple back surgeries, only to have more days with pain than without pain, I totally get feeling like you're trapped. As someone who's had a medical procedure which goes 99% flawlessly for others but winds up in complications, I I, I get what you've gone through in a way. I, I see what it's like to feel like, how could this be happening to me and how could it be happening again? If we're honest, most of our day-to-day life feels constrained or difficult, busy or filled with tasks that are mundane or even taxing. Parenting was so much easier when my son Jeremiah was still in the womb. Am I the only one? All I did was read books about how to be a good father, and I felt great at it. Being a missionary was simpler when all it was was vision. Before I met students at American University and students at Georgetown University that had their own struggles, questions, doubts, and fears, it became complex. Because even blessings bring complexity. As a modern-day prophet once said, more money more problems. Following Jesus for me sometimes feels very freeing at the altar when the music is loud, but when the music stops, the feeling of freedom seems to go away. Can anyone relate to that? Can we be honest enough to say that's where I'm at, or I know someone who's there, or I've been there recently? And that, like every single good story, whether in scripture, in film, in literature, is where we experience tension. See, tension is how and where heroes are made. It's where protagonists are formed. It's where a story arc begins to bend. It's not comfortable, but tension has the ability to bring about the best in us. And it has the ability to lead us to a moment of change. Paul, in writing to a local church in Rome, wrote this. It's in your Bibles and in mine in Romans 8, 14 through 17. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are indeed God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may share in his glory. Adoption to sonship, if you're taking notes, is this biblical shorthand that means freedom. We are designed to live free. And not just freed from sin and death, but freed for a life abundant in Christ. I have to remind my students, they're not just freed to then live out their own dreams. They are free to live out the will of God in a way that will bring them the deepest joy they've ever felt. We aren't freed just so that we can let go of our obstacles to do it our way. But we are freed so that we can walk in freedom with and towards Christ. Now, it's interesting because in Scripture, when we read the word brothers, I'll do a little trivia. You probably know this, although my students sometimes struggle. When we read the word brothers in Scripture, who is the audience? Everyone, right? We read brothers, and we know that it means brothers and sisters. We know that. But in a postmodern, post-Christian, polarized context... 
It's challenging when students who are exploring faith for the first time open up the Bible or hear a sermon and they see brothers or they see mankind and they feel like the Bible is leaving people out. So it's why I typically prefer translations that would use more inclusive language that would say brothers and sisters or that would say humanity or persons or people instead of the generic men, which you and I know means everyone. The original authors know that it means everyone. But sometimes this generation coming up before us, it can be a stumbling block for them. However, I love this passage in that it does say adoption to sonship. Because that meant something of unique privilege in that time and culture. Even in the NIV, which typically would render things in a gender-inclusive way, it still says sonship because to the original listeners, that meant a seat at the table. That meant an inheritance. That meant the ability to speak up in matters of the family and of the family business. That's why in verse 17, we read about being co-heirs because there's a connection between adoption, sonship, and inheritance. So I love that brothers and sisters, you and I are invited into sonship, meaning we get a seat at the table because of Jesus. Not a second class seat, Jesus says, not as a seat, as a servant, but as a friend, as trusted sons, so that we could know, men and women alike, what it means to receive in fullness what God has for us. One of my favorite ABKisms from the book is when he reminds us in his reading of First and Second Peter that when we come to know Jesus in salvation, we have the opportunity to receive the package deal, to utilize the entire package. We're not just freed from difficulty eternally, we're freed from difficulty today. In Jesus, we receive healing and freedom, peace and prosperity, hope and strength. That yes, our eternity is with him, but we actually get to start to live into that eternity here and now. That's what it means to be an ambassador of Christ. That's what it means to be a city upon a hill. What's interesting is that Paul knows something about captivity and freedom. When he mentions slavery, when he mentions being captured or captive in verse 14, he's talking about it from his experience. And and if we're honest, being imprisoned might be part of your story or your family's story. I'll be honest, I've had relatives and friends, students of mine, who have been in prison. And let me just be clear, it wasn't because they were preaching the gospel. They went to prison for other reasons. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. So when Paul talks about freedom, it's not a classroom concept. He's not speaking from an ivory tower. He's connecting it to his lived experience. So what do you and I do when we live in this tension? I don't feel free, but the Bible says I'm free. It's hard for me to identify as a child of God because I feel like he's mad at me. What do I do with those mixed emotions? I don't think about getting a heavenly inheritance because it seems that most of my spiritual life might be filled with do's and don'ts and guilt. As we seek to begin to ask and answer that question, what do we do when our experiences are different than the prescribed experiences from scripture? I want to direct us to a small story that I'll summarize in Acts 16. Paul and Silas, you might know the story, were in prison for proclaiming the gospel. And so they get to prison, and what do they keep doing? Proclaiming the gospel. The text tells us that around midnight, they start to sing songs, start to sing hymns. They start to pray so everyone can hear them, so they can be a witness. And then we tend to focus in our kind of Western American context on the second part of the story, where their kind of shackles are gone and the doors swing open and and they're shifted from captivity to free. But I think the greatest miracle in this story is that they were free the entire time. Because freedom is a state of mind and a state of heart. They were never in captivity spiritually. They never forgot who they were and whose they were. 
They never lost sight of their identity. And note, although when we worship and when we pray, breakthrough happens, absolutely. God loves to intervene. It's interesting that if you read this, Paul and Silas were not worshiping and praying for breakthrough. It just happened. They were worshiping and praying because that was their normal response to life. Because for them, prayer and worship was the gift itself. Because they understood that to follow Jesus, there were times when you were to seek his hand. But most of all, there were times when you needed to seek his face. In their prayer and worship, we don't have any evidence in the text that they asked to be released. And what's interesting, Luke, who writes the book of Acts, the height of the story of the narrative isn't their freedom. It's that the jailers experienced freedom and came to Christ. That their whole family came to know God and were baptized in that moment. My students love that story because they're like, I could just worship and praise through the breakthrough. But what was interesting is that Paul and Silas weren't worried about getting in trouble. They were worried about being obedient. Because what they were doing that got them in prison, they were still doing in the prison. And it it says, there's like a sentence or two in the text where then they finally leave, they perform this baptism, and they just continue to preach. The greatest freedom that you and I can experience is freedom in our interior life. Regardless of circumstance, regardless of when the bills are due or if the business is failing, if the relationship is rocky. If we take our cues from Paul and Silas, we understand that just being in connection with God is enough. That he is our sufficiency. That being in his presence is gift enough for us. Now, if we go back to our primary passage in Romans, I think that there's a word in there that most of us, if we're honest, don't like. It's towards the end of 14 through 17. It says, now if we're children, we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs of Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we might share in his glory. Sometimes we leave off that part of the verse after the comma. We're like, oh, sufferings. Skip scene. (laughs) To word it another way, it says, when we share in his sufferings, we'll share in his glory. And that's when we'll be living into our identity of heirs of God and co-heirs of Christ. So the bad news is they're suffering. The good news is we get to share in his glory. And that's really interesting because I grew up in a context where worship was all about giving God glory, and it is. And then I stumbled upon this verse as an adult, and I realized that God in his graciousness was saying, if I'm willing to suffer with him, I can partake in his glory. I mean, Romans 8 goes on to say that we are glorified with him, which sounds almost too good to be true. But here's, I think, what's happening. Non-Christians try to seek their own glory. Maturing Christians come to recognize that we get glory, but it's not ours. We are designed for glory, just not our own. This verse tells us that if we will suffer with him, we will be glorified with him. And it won't be about us, but we're invited into the story. Jesus in John 16, puts it like this. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I love how Jesus is both realistic and hopeful. I wish I had more friends that were living in that balance of realism and hopefulness. I don't know if you've ever been there, but maybe you've had a difficult day or you've got a difficult medical diagnosis, or something has happened, you've lost a job, and you go to another believer, and they say something, and they mean well, but it doesn't go well. You know, they'll quote a Bible verse to you. I remember when I first was dealing with mental health concerns, I went to a pastor friend of mine, and I said, I'm just dealing with anxiety and depression. Like, no matter what I do, I just, I don't feel like myself. And, and, He was well-intentioned, but his response was, are you reading the Bible and praying? I wish I had been bold enough to laugh. I I, I just like walked away. I was like, guess I got to double up, got to do morning and evening devotionals. The devotionals were great, but the chemical imbalances remained. Crazy how that works. 
But Jesus says, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. In our campus community in Chi Alpha, we talk about trauma. We talk about difficulty and how God wants to meet people in that. We talk about how sometimes miracles happen at an altar, but sometimes they happen like manna. Every day you have to go fight for it. You have to go get it. You have to walk in perseverance. There's this term that we've been talking about on campus called spiritual bypassing. And it's when you're going through something difficult and you open it to a friend or a pastor or a small group leader or a Sunday school teacher, and they respond in a way that kind of bypasses your pain. They might be well-intentioned and what they're saying might be true, but it might not be appropriate. They might say, well, well, God's got a plan or God loves you, which is true. If I'm sharing with someone, oh, you know, my family member just passed away. I typically don't want like a Hallmark Christian card. That's just me. Maybe y'all are different. That's just me. What's interesting is Jesus never does that. He meets people in their pain and he sits with them. Yes, he speaks truth, but he gives his presence. And that's why worship and prayer is so powerful, because it's the presence. And we know that, right, when we've had a difficult day or a hard week. Just talking to somebody about it that will listen and not give advice is a gift. It doesn't change anything externally, but it changes something in us. It's beautiful that Jesus is a good enough friend that he does that, and then he still wants to intervene and make it right. He's asking us, in a world that is broken, that is challenging, that is difficult, would we be willing to give people the gift of withness? Being with them. Sitting with them. It's interesting because that's how we first get to know Jesus, as the God that is with, Emmanuel, God with us. He comes first as that, before Savior, before Shepherd, before King. He comes simply to be with. And then he asks, do you want to be healed? And it's interesting, many times people come to Jesus for physical healing and end up getting spiritual healing first and then physical healing. Students on our campuses who are far from God sometimes have questions about the the historicity of the Bible, the reliability of the Gospels, but what they're really asking are different questions. They're saying, I've been hurt. I've been broken. I've seen hypocrisy. I've lived through scandal. See, they're asking questions that we might respond with an apologetic, but what they really need is pastoral care. Because in 10 years, I've never argued anyone into the kingdom of God. As brilliant as I am, and I am brilliant, I've never argued anyone to the kingdom of God. But I've loved people into the kingdom of God. I've sat with people and just listened to them and walked with them, and they've made a decision in the kingdom of God. It's interesting because... We should study and know why we believe what we believe. We should know that the Bible is true. We should know how it came to be formed, this library of books. But if we're honest, most, if not all of us, didn't come to Jesus because of an academic lecture proving Jesus. We came to Jesus because he encountered us and we encountered him. So we have to remember, what was it like to be without him? How did it come to be that we believed in him and then can we share that good news with others are we willing to enter people's mess so that they would experience jesus what if we realize that every time that trouble finds us we remind ourselves of psalm 23 6 that goodness and mercy are pursuing us all the days of our life one of my favorite odgs old dead guys old dead gals charles spurgeon said this, he said, Jesus is the hound of heaven, doggedly pursuing every person he's created. We often think that we have to pursue him, and we should, but he's always pursuing us. He's pursuing us at creation. He's pursuing us at the cross, and he's pursuing us through community. You might be the way that he wants to pursue your neighbors, your coworkers, the other parents at your children's school, You might be the answer to prayer that someone's been praying that God would intervene, that the kingdom would come. What if when anxiety creeps in in my life and yours, we realize that it's an opportunity, it's a signal, it's an indicator to ask for God's help, that we've been freed. 
that yes, we are headed towards an eternity with him, but we can start living into that now. Imagine it with me. Close your eyes for a moment. You're going through your week. And all of the problems that you had last week, somehow, some way, the sermon didn't defeat them. They're still with you next week. What would it look like to put on the posture of walking in freedom as a child of God in those situations? What if the freedom that you're praying would come to your circumstance, God wants to come through you to your circumstance? What if the freedom that you want to experience, he's actually asking you to model so that others around you would have a glimpse of freedom? God, we pray that in our week, in the ups and downs, whether it's a crisis or it feels mundane, that we would walk in freedom because of you, not in our own strength, but because of what you have done. Amen. See, freedom was won at the empty tomb, but freedom for us today is found in abiding, John 15. We cannot be free unless we spend time with the spirit of freedom, Jesus. We cannot walk in freedom or in power unless we spend extravagant time with him. My students, the young men that I mentor on campus, I think they get upset with me because they'll be talking about their struggles with sin or destructive habits. And I'll always bring it back to how are they approaching this problem with God? Are they inviting him into it? Are they willing to abide with Jesus and to be shaped by him, to be formed by him? Thinking through this verse that we read in Romans, the questions for us are clear. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. So are you and I being led by the Spirit of God? He's speaking. Are we listening? I got to be honest, and I try to be honest with the students that I minister to. Most, if not all, of the dry seasons in my life spiritually were unintentionally seasons where I self-exiled myself from God. He didn't kind of step in for me in my experience and say, hey, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to kind of leave you on your own. Read the book of Job and have fun, Blaine. That didn't happen. But it's because I got too busy doing the work of the ministry and not letting the Holy Spirit minister to me. It's seasons where I thought I had all the answers and I was doing the right things, but I wasn't being with him. The seasons of separation weren't because his character changed, it's because my routines shifted. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but I notice this often, at least in D.C. I haven't spent much time in this area of Maryland, but at least in D.C., the worst drivers, don't worry, I'm not going to say are from Maryland, the worst drivers are like Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, taxi cab. And sometimes I'm like, Lord, it is their entire job to drive. How could they be this bad? Why would they choose this? They are not skilled. I remember I was walking onto campus and I was complaining to the Lord. I thought it was praying. I don't think it counts according to audacious prayers. But I was complaining like, Lord, I, that, that Lyft driver was so terrible. Why did you let that be their vocation? That, that guy should have been a baker or, or, or something else, an elementary school teacher, but a driver? Like their job is driving and they're bad at it. And the Holy Spirit was like, Blaine, your job is being with me and you're bad at it. Pastor's whole job is being with me. And yet we see scandals of pastors building their own platforms and kingdoms. And it's interesting, the thing that we're called to the most can be the area where we fail the greatest because we're familiar, because we think we got it together. You know it's true. When you first got your driver's license, you were 10 and 2. You even, you even used this thing called a signal. Now you're just like, whatever. You know, when I first came into ministry, I was spending so much time doing this thing called praying and reading scripture abiding. I just, I didn't want to get up and say something. 
you know, that might offend the Lord or that wouldn't connect or, or to a need that someone had. And the, the, the more I got into ministry, the more I kind of just did it on my own. But I didn't see any fruit. No long-lasting fruit comes without abiding with him, John 15. So our freedom, the origination of our freedom is found in the empty tomb, but we receive daily by abiding, by being with him. As the worship band comes and as we prepare to close and respond, I want to remind us, especially if you don't feel free, you don't feel like you could walk or fly in freedom. I want to remind us of the type of Jesus that we serve. In the words of Dr. Lockhart, can I tell you for a moment about my king? Is that okay? Oral Roberts put it like this. In Genesis, we see Jesus as the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, Jesus is our high priest. In Numbers, Jesus is the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, Jesus is a prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, Jesus shows up as the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he's our judge and lawgiver. In Ruth, Jesus shows himself as our kinsman redeemer. In 1st and 2nd Samuel, we see Jesus as our trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, he's our reigning king. In Ezra, he shows up as our faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he's the rebuilder of the broken. In Esther, Jesus shows himself as Mordecai. In Job, he's our ever-living redeemer, saying, For I know that my redeemer lives. In Psalms, Jesus is revealed as our shepherd. In Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, he is our wisdom. In Song of Solomon, he's our lover and bridegroom. And in Isaiah, he is our prince of peace. Amen. In Jeremiah, Jesus shows up as our righteous branch. In Ezekiel, he's the wonderful four-faced man. And in Daniel, he's the fourth man in the fiery furnace with us in all of life's troubles. In Hosea, he's the faithful husband, forever married to the backslider. In Joel, he's the baptizer with the Holy Ghost and fire. In Amos, he's our burden bearer. In Obadiah, he is mighty to save. In Jonah, he's our great foreign missionary. In Micah, he's the messenger of beautiful feet. In Nahum, he's the avenger of God's elect. In Habakkuk, he's God's evangelist, crying out, Revive the work in the midst of your servant. All these years I've been waiting. In Zephaniah, he's our savior. In Haggai, he's the restorer of God's lost heritage. In Zechariah, he's the fountain open up in the house of David for sin and uncleanness. In Malachi, he is the son of righteousness, rising with healing for us on his wings. In Matthew, Jesus shows up as our Messiah. In Mark, he's the wonder worker. In Luke, he is the son of man. In John, he is the son of God. In Acts, he is the Holy Ghost. And in Romans, he is our great justifier. In 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Jesus shows up as our sanctifier. In Galatians, he's the redeemer from the curse of the law. In Ephesians, he's the Christ of unsearchable riches. In Philippians, he is the God who supplies every single one of our needs. In Colossians, he's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Jesus shows up as our soon coming king. In 1st and 2nd Timothy, he's our mediator between God and man. In Titus, he's our faithful pastor. In Philemon, he's the friend that sticks closer than a brother and brings freedom to the captive. In Hebrews, he's the blood of the everlasting covenant. In James, he's our great physician, for it says the prayer of the faithful and righteous person shall save the sick. In First and Second Peter, he's our chief shepherd, who soon will appear with the crown that has glory that will never fade. In 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he is love defined. In Jude, he is the Lord coming when, with 10,000 of his saints. And in Revelation, he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Who is Jesus? Who do we have access to? What is his name? What is his power? He's Abel's sacrifice. He's Noah's rainbow. He's Abraham's ram, Isaac's well, Jacob's scepter, and Moses' rod. 
He's Joshua's son and moon stud still. He's Elijah's mantle, Elisha's staff, Gideon's fleece, Samuel's horn of oil, and David's slingshot. He's Hezekiah's sundial, Daniel's visions, Amos's burdens, and Malachi's sons of righteousness. He's Peter's shadow, Stephen's signs and wonders, Paul's handkerchiefs and aprons, and John's pearly white city. He's the father to the orphan. He brings freedom to the oppressed. He's near to the brokenhearted. He can be trusted when all else fails. He is Jesus, and he wants to speak to us today. He's always faithful. He's never far. He never forgets our name. And when we return to him, he comes not with anger, but with a welcome, like the gracious father. When we live as prodigals, he invites us into a warm embrace. Who is this Jesus? He's better than we can deserve. He's more than we could ask for. He's our great inheritance because of the work done on the cross. Would you stand with me and worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Jesus, we're grateful for you. We want to be with you. Speak to us. Speak specifically into our circumstance. Bring us freedom. Bring us clarity. Help us to walk in obedience to your voice. And if we haven't heard your voice in a while, give us the boldness to go back to what you said most recently and continue to walk in faith, knowing that you're working behind the scenes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Dad,